Welcome to Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup. I'm your host, Jason Bland, and I hope people are getting to watch this because I didn't get to even share this out. So, Jamie, I know you're in the panel right now. Share, 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 share away because we were getting Jeff working here at the very last minute. Uh, but tonight's going to be an awesome show. I love doing these UFO shows. That's what it's going to be. We got guest Paul Blake Smith, author of M41, The Bombshell of uh, at Roswell, and his new book is going to be called uh, Sexy Alien Races. Uh, but the, this is an incident we're going to talk about. It happened back in uh, Missouri in 1941, a UFO incident before Roswell. This is pre-Roswell. Not many people know about it. I heard Stanton Freeman mention it uh, recently when I was at a lecture he did, uh, which I thought was interesting. I'm like, hey, I'm going to have this guy to talk about it. Uh, so it's gonna be, we're going to get UFOs. And then, of course, what we do every Sunday night is the World Wide Web a Weird. And uh, we, we're going to make it short with the articles. I got five of them tonight because I want to talk just a little bit about what happened in Vegas uh, last week here. Um, I have some things to say, and uh, if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but there are there's some things that have been going on with this, and if people have been watching my post, I've, I definitely have some things to say. So, uh, And, of course, we'll have call-in lines later in the show. Uh, we definitely have the OOJ Bland OO Skype ID, and hopefully if everything's working right with Jeff, we'll have the Soup Live Chat uh, 800 Live Chat Skype line open. All right, guys, be with you in just one sec. Welcome to another night of Paranormal Soup. I'm your host, Jason Bland. Uh, Jamie, are you there with me? We're having a rough start tonight. <laughs> I'm here. I'm getting the link shirt out right now. All right. Do be, be good for me here and uh, share it in the event. I always share it in the event. I didn't get a chance to share it there, so share it in the event for people to see. Of course, uh, share it on my timeline if you can. Tag me or put it in my timeline. I always do all that. I didn't have a chance to, so I don't know how many people are catching the start of the show. And, of course, we're streaming out on Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network for people listening there. Hopefully, they are hearing us there. Uh, we were getting technical problems right up before the show. We're like, one of those nights, but I've been excited and pumped to do this, and I want to get rolling because we have a great guest tonight with a lot to talk about, and you know how time flies. So let's go ahead and roll into the World Wide Web a Weird. Tonight on the World Wide Web of Weird, we're going to start off with one of my favorite topics, time travel. Yes, time travel. We're going to start off with about a Wyoming man arrested after claiming he traveled from 2048 to warn us of an alien invasion. Music off there. So, Wyoming man, this comes from Fox News. A Wyoming man arrested after claiming he traveled from 2048 to warn aliens of an invasion. Um, Bryant Johnson was arrested for public intoxication on Monday night after he allegedly told police that he came from the future to warn of an alien invasion. Police were called to a street in Casper where Johnson reportedly told them he traveled from the year 2048 and was trying to warn the town that aliens would be arriving next year, KCWY reported. Um, Johnson said that everyone needed to leave as quickly as possible and demanded to speak to the president of the town, KCW said. I guess in 2048, they're presidents of towns. Uh, he reportedly told law enforcement that he was able to travel back to 2017, even though he said he meant to travel to 2018. Don't time travelers always have that problem? Uh, because aliens filled his body with alcohol and had him stand on a giant pad to transport him to the past. So are they different aliens trying to get him to warn us about another alien race? Or I don't know. Or they're like, my bad, we'll just send you back. You just fix it all, uh, young young Bryant. You just fix it, you go back. But they have to get, we have to get you drunk first before we send you back in time. Yeah. Isn't that always the way? 
Yeah, I guess so. The alien informant allegedly smelled of alcohol, had wa watery and bloodshot eyes, and slurred his speech, police noted. Uh, Johnson had a blood alcohol content of 0. .136. <laughs> I was just going to ask if he was drunk when he had the experience. Well, yeah, he was definitely drunk, and I, I guess that's the way to time travel. You have to be intoxicated. That he said they had the aliens had to, he had to have him intoxicated. Okay, on to number two. This comes from the Mirror.co.uk here. Ghost hunters capture eerie images of female spirit terrorizing pub for years by throwing glasses. A photograph appears to show the ghostly shape of a woman uh, stood facing the wall despite the photographer being alone inside the Griffin Inn in Yorkshire at the time. Uh, a ghost hunter has captured eerie images of what he claims to be a female entity in a pub said to have been terrorizing his local boozers for years by throwing large glasses around. Andrew Williamson snapped what appears to be uh, appears to show a ghostly shape of a woman facing the wall, and even though he was alone at the time. Uh, and, and for anybody listening on Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network, just always check out uh, Midwest Paranormal Presents Facebook page or Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup's Facebook page or our YouTube channel, Paranormal Soup, and you will find a world web of weird video usually posted on there. And I don't always get to, but I try to post that on there. So if you always want to go back and see what we were showing, um, of course, you can always jump right on in on our Facebook webcast, which is live right now. Uh, Michael also says he sees glasses flying off his shelves, but he thinks the spooky stories add to the charm of the place. Andrew claims he can feel ghostly presences and uses his paranormal ability to capture extreme uh, photographs. It is while he was investigating a reported haunting at the Griffin Inn in Yorkshire that he, the 50-year-old sensed a presence of a lady in the darkness with him. Uh, Andrew from Wakefield said, when I was setting up, I knew there was an entity in this environment, but I didn't expect to get what I got. It's a woman. She never gave me her name. She was saying nothing to nobody. I just knew that there was an entity there. The pub has a history of things happening uh, when the place is closed up at night, which showed up on a CCTV, but not was, uh, what is causing them. There are regular things that happen in the night, like glasses falling off of shelves for no particular reason and bottles falling on the floor when no one is in. Um, pretty... I don't know. I mean, could it be a superimposition? We were hoping Todd would get on. He was trying. He might hop on later with us. Todd would have been a good one uh, to get his opinion on this this photograph. You know, and I wish it came late. I wish I could have talked tonight or shown the photo from the Stanley Hotel that's going viral right now in the last two days. I, I just didn't have it set up for the World Wide Web. Maybe I'll put that in next week's show. Um, but that's a really interesting photo, too. That's actually from a still and not from a still from a video camera, per, um, a security camera. This is a photo. Okay. Yeah, this is a photo here. All right, we're going to move on to speaking of video. Um, this is or security camera. Uh, this comes from uh, RT Live. Uh, poltergeist wreaks havoc at historic Irish school and spine chilling CT CCTV footage. Um, supernatural forces appear to be at work in an Irish high school with a video footage emerging of an unexplained spooky activity after hours in Deer Park's uh, CBS. I guess that's what they're saying. Founded in 1828, the school is one of the oldest in the Cook uh, County Cor uh, County Cork. It makes sense that it would be as haunted as everyone knows the dead like to stock buildings with a bit of character. I, I, I call shenanigans on this video. Go ahead and play it, though, Jeff. We've got audio with it. So you see it open the door in the back for people listening. And then slams it. Now some other activity is about to take place here. That's all for moving. some more shenanigans here. Okay, I think that's about it. Oh, no, wait, one more thing. One more thing. They got to just put the cherry on top on this. Nicely placed wet floor sign in a, in a school that's shut down. I love how the wet floor sign's there. Who's it for? Because obviously this is late at night and 3 a.m. in the morning. 
Oh, and it gets full. All right, I call total blarky on this video, and maybe I don't know. Maybe it could be real, but I really think it's just all staged. Uh, I think this is probably a theater group at the school or something having a good time, or a teacher at the school is like, let's make a fake viral video just to see how it's done, and we'll find out later or something. But I, I think it's malarkey. I honestly do. Uh, that's my censored version of what I want to call it. Um, but the door slamming, that's probably something, you know, that could, that's easily somebody back there doing that. It, you know, this would be staged. Um, the, the locker moving, uh, that there's a window there. Now, it looks like it's closed, but it could be just enough closed that there's a little slit that somebody's hand can get through and just push that locker, just push it, make it move like that. And then uh, the other locker that opens and everything, that could, again, you, you, you do not see strings when you want them to be. They could have already have that somewhat slightly ajar and make it pop open like that and pulled on it. I mean, maybe I could be wrong. There could be other ways of doing it, too, but that, that's my best guess, and I just, you know, it's just not likely usually when you see these videos are 100 percent bs and i'm not trying to be the the the, the naysayer there are, are going to be good videos but this just to me looks like total staged malarkey okay let's move on all right number four here uh this one this one interests me we're going to talk about um a ufo crash is more like this is talks about blood suckers but i swear there's some hints of alien stuff going on here um oh my article disappeared that's not good um they erased I see it the on article. The screen. Oh, there it goes. Okay. No, well, that's his. He put that over. Acts of care. This comes from um, uh, Times. Mw Times Group. The Times Group. That's the name of the website. A uh, Acts of terror continue set uh, in among fear grip residents of the Mulanji and Falambi districts. I'm totally butchering that. Sorry. Uh, following strong beliefs of the existence of bloodsuckers. This comes days after the Malawi Police Service issued a statement that the bloodsucker issue is a hoax. We have established that the people are no longer sleeping in their houses but in groups for fear of being attacked. This is during our visit to the traditional authorities Mithlamanja, Mabuko, and Mulanji. I'm butchering that. Sorry. Where the Communities believe bloodsuckers are from Mozambique and are collecting the blood used for rituals to earn more money. The Malawi News has been told uh, by the communities that they have been fa uh, failing to catch per uh, prepar uh, I cannot talk tonight. perpetrators because they are using magical powers. They are allegedly turning uh, into cats or dogs before disappearing. We observe this, uh, the communities have become paranoid. This is particularly noticed uh, the TA Michelin area, I've totally butchered that, where the community pleaded with us to ensure that we leave the place early for the fear that we may be attacked. The communities are questioning and in extreme cases attacking strangers. So don't show up in their community and think you're a, a bloodsucker. Uh, the community uh, uh, alleges the bloodsuckers properly referred to as an anima Anima Papa are using some technology, we didn't say to say technology, which involves initial spraying of a chemical or some electrical power to weaken the target before sucking the blood. The blood sucking is allegedly to be done using some remote controlled gadgets. This sounds all alien to me. You know, um, I'm not going to read the whole article. It goes on, but you, you read it, and more and more of the stuff they're talking about, they're talking about these bloodsuckers and them putting needles in their head. And to me, it sounds like these people are having some kind of alien experience. You know, they look at it as bloodsuckers and could probably turn to their ancient myths and stuff. But all this stuff sounds like a bunch of people getting abducted. And they talk about them stealing their blood. Well, maybe it's an alien abduction. I don't know. I'm taking a leap there. But something really weird. Like I said, check that out at um, times.mw uh, is the website. Um, just go to that and you can find it. All right. Uh, last up until we get we get into the Las Vegas scene here really quick is um, uh, Santa Claus's grave might have been discovered. Sorry, Santa Claus is dead. <laughs> The Santa Claus untouched grave may be beneath the church in Turkey and Anatala, archaeologists say. Archaeologists may have become a step closer to finding the grave of St. Nicholas, more popularly known as Santa Claus, as they discover what may be the actual grave of the Christian, uh, Christmas saint below the surface of a church in Turkey's southern Anatala province, reports said Monday. A special section containing a grave site was recently discovered in St. Nicholas's church, located in Anatala's uh, Dermy district, known as the birthplace of Santa Claus. So, Santa Claus is dead. I am so sorry, people. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like I said, you can get this from the daily s a b a h is it dot com saba daily saba dot com. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, he was based off of a real saint, and now they found his grave. I guess Christmas is over. <laughs> Hope no little kids are watching tonight. Uh oh. Okay. At least he exists, though. That's you know, at least he existed. Okay. <laughs> All right, really quick because we don't have much time. I'm gonna give this five minutes. So. Um, 
let me uh, put the screen on myself here for a second. So there's been a lot going on since the shooting in Las Vegas, and uh, I post a lot of things. I've had people say, oh, not the conspiracy stuff. Come on. Everything's not a conspiracy. <sighs> I hate to tell you people, there's something that stinks to high hell about all this. And if you're not thinking it's a conspiracy, you don't, I'm not asking you to go into some wild conspiracy stuff that's going on out there. Just ask the questions. This, something doesn't seem right. And this, I'm going to play, I have a lot of videos we can play. We could do a whole show on this. We're not, because I got a good guest. So I want to make this quick. We're going to play this video here. Um, well, you know, Jeff, let me play it because I know the audio is kind of messed up on your end. I want to make sure the audio is straight. So I'm going to play it. Sorry, Jeff. I just want to make sure I get the audio right um, on this one. So I'm going to, we'll have a little, little echo. Yeah, it does. It sounds like automatic gunfire. This is a cabbie who filmed this. She's right in the parking lot. Now, you heard the fire at the beginning. Let's go back to that. Let's go back. Right to the beginning. Listen, there's that fire. Five seconds. Okay. There it is again. That echo timing wouldn't be right if that was echo. So she heard the shots right over at the beginning of this video. First you hear it in the distance, five seconds. Then you hear the big yeah, shots. Yeah, it, it sounds like automatic gunfire. She's hearing it. Now uh, wait. Now people have said it's echo. It's not echo. I, I saw, saw the, the audio, audio comparisons. comparisons. You don't hear the loud noise before, do you? Now it sounds like it's coming from um, farther away. Now, that might have been him switching locations, right? But if you listen to the beginning of it, if you listen to the beginning of it, let's go back, very beginning. Okay, here we go. Okay, here, that, that, that shot is, and then one, two, three, four, five seconds, really loud, okay? So if that is just him switching locations, that would mean he has to run from one end of the suite to the other end of the suite in five seconds. No way. If it's echo, well, guess what? Listen to the, after you hear loud sounds, you're going to hear it again after the loud sounds. If that's echo, it's not, it's, it's right after. It's not five seconds. Listen. Right after it, not five seconds. So it, this is the biggest clue right here. The audio doesn't lie. There had to have been more than one shooter. As simple as that. One other thing. There's a lot of questions, a lot of freaking questions on all this. This is my biggest one. After driving home today, I listened to 60 Minutes, okay? This is the death scene. It is graphic, but I blocked out his face because I don't know who could be watching tonight, and it's on Facebook. I blocked out his face, but I apologize for there is blood in this scene. This is the picture of Stephen Paddock. I blocked out his face. All right, I've outlined something here that you should see. He, okay, the 60 Minutes interview that was just on today, the police officers say they entered the room. The reporter asked him, I wish I could have this clip to play. The reporter asked one of the police officers that was first one into the room, what did you see? He was the first one in the room. And he tells her the descriptions, the guns everywhere and everything. She's like, what was his body like? You know, what did you see when you saw his body? He's like, well, I couldn't see a gunshot room wound. I just see blood coming out of his mouth. And I saw the gun above his head about, you know, away from the body. That means no one moved that gun when it comes to the police department. Now, I've had people say, well, the gun's away because they, they kicked it away, or it's away because it flew out of his hands behind him. There's a problem with that. Blood don't lie, as Dexter would say. Follow this line here. I don't know if you can see the arrow on my screen, but there's a trail of blood drops all the way leading here to where the gun is. Oop. Um, we'll zoom in, move it down. See the blood drops, okay? To get those kind of blood drops, and I'm not a blood expert, I'm not, but it's simple, it's simple physics here, people. Uh, the blood drops would not appear like that from it just flow, flying through the air really quickly, okay, and landing there. That gun had to been picked up. And you can see, I wish I didn't get the, the picture the way I wanted it. 
this part down here, there's a big bloody stain on his chest, probably where the gun landed as he fell back. Now, did he shoot himself or did somebody put a gun in his mouth and shoot him or move the body? It looks like his body, other people come, it looks like his body, if you look at the pictures, they are graphic, that his body was moved. Um, we got to ask these questions, people. The main question is, for all these people naysaying, saying, why don't talk to conspiracy about this, a bunch of people died, why you got to jump on conspiracy, I ask you, why do you trust your government? Why do you trust the FBI? Have you not learned anything? Have you not paid attention? Because they've done nothing but lie to us for decades. Look at the affidavits. They have set up terrorists with weapons and bombs. It is in court affidavits. The FBI has set up terrorists with weapons and bombs in a scheme. So they've, they've set up somebody who was determined afterwards to be too mentally incapable to do it on his own, and the case was dropped because the FBI gave him all the instructions and plans on how to do a terrorist. I think I had no idea what he was doing. They just needed somebody to look like a terrorist. Things aren't right, and the things are coming out about this guy being a drug runner. or not drug runner, sorry, uh, uh, arms dealer. And there's evidence about connections to the CIA. There's questions to be asked, people, and don't naysay us because we are asking these questions. Naysay yourself for not asking the questions, for just taking the stupid crap your media throws at you and the stupid crap your government throws at you. Do you really trust your government? I don't. So that is all I have to say on that for now. We might do another show one day on this subject. But let's get out of the world wide web of weird. This is beyond weird to me. This is the land of confusion. Uh, for people listening on Late Night in the Midlands, of course, you get to hear the music. People not on Facebook, there is music that plays. That's just on Late Night in the Midlands. When we come back, we're going to have our guest, Paul Blake Smith. We're going to talk about an incident in Missouri in 1941, a UFO crash, before, before Watt Roswell even ever happened. So to me, this is for people who are influenced or anything. This is a, a really interesting topic. All right, guys, be back with you in just a minute. All right. Tonight we have guest Paul Blake Smith. We're going to talk about an incident that happened in Missouri in 1941, a UFO crash. This is pre-Roswell. That's what's so interesting to me. Anything UFO-wise that happens pre-Roswell, to me, we should all try to take a look at very closely. And it's really hard with the amount of time, you know, 75 years or more, has gone by since this incident to kind of find these details. Well, our, our guest tonight, Paul Blake Smith, has looked into it and written two books on the subject. He's written uh, the MO41 bombshell at Roswell, and then two presidents, two accidents, the, uh, and MO41 and other strange occurrences. We're going to talk about that. We also have a new book coming out called Sexly, Sexy Alien Races. We're going to talk about that as well tonight. All right, we should have our guest here in just a sec. You there with us, Paul? Right here. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, been really excited to do this show. To me, anything, like, I don't know if you heard me there before I brought you on, anything pre-Roswell to me is so interesting because it's beyond the influence of the media. I mean, of course, Roswell, I think, like your case, wasn't really discovered later until the 80s. Um, how did you get involved in this case? Now, as I understand, it's from your hometown. That's right. I was born and raised and uh, lived in Cape Girardeau for 33 years. It's a small town of about 40,000 people now on the uh, banks of the Mississippi River. Back in 1941, there were about 20,000, and it was a very conservative uh, church-going community back in the day. And this uh, event occurred uh, about uh, seven, eight months before America entered World War II. The war was raging around the world, but not in uh, America. Right. It was still a pretty sleepy time. It was before Pearl Harbor, before, you know, 90% of America didn't feel like we had any business going to war. Right. In those days, people were very patriotic. You did what your government or your military ordered you to do. You just, it was the idea that you would uh, pipe up, cause trouble, protest, or picket or something was absolutely unheard of back in those days. Well, yeah, no kidding. This is pre-60, you know, peace, love, and protest. Right. You know, there were, I, don't, I don't think there were protests very much except for, you know, labor protests. That is correct. Uh, FDR was president, and... Uh, Harry S. Truman was an influential senator in Washington, D.C. He was getting ready for some important military hearings on Capitol Hill. Uh, the first lady was out of town on what I believe was the night of the affair. Through my own research, I found out I be the best date for this would be Saturday night, April 12, 1941. 
And it's interesting to note that Eleanor Roosevelt, the very famous first lady, right. uh, was supposed to fly into Washington so she could be uh, up and early uh, to the Easter sunrise services for the Freemasons out at Arlington Cemetery. For some reason, somebody canceled her flight. She had to get her, her entourage together, get their luggage from the airport, Logan Airport in Boston, uh, go across town to the train station and take a train and remain on the ground all the way down the East Coast Corridor uh, to get to Washington. And uh, there was no sunrise service. It was very rare, uh, f not for the Roosevelts, there was a service. But it was uh, very rare because uh, FDR was a hardcore Freemason, as was the vice president, and wa as was Harry Truman, who was the grandmaster Freemason of the state of Missouri at the time. Right. I mean... <laughs> You know, they talk about so many presidents being Freemasons and uh, that they used early in the days of UFO cover-ups, they used Freemasonry uh, as a way to get people to be quiet. Like, hey, you're part of the club. You know when we tell you to do something, you do it. That's probably true. We can't absolutely prove it. Not. But in those days, uh, Freemasons were just uh, very prevalent in every society. Cape Girardeau's mayor was a... Um, Knights Templar Freemason, and a number of police officers and citizens were Freemasons. The governor of the Missouri, uh, the governor of the state of Missouri, was a Freemason, and uh, as I said, Harry was a Freemason. Uh, FDR, who ran uh, the country, was a Freemason, and J. Edgar Hoover, who ran the FBI, was a Freemason. They were a pretty tight knit group, and they had secrets and kept things to themselves. Even though I still feel to this day they're a very uh, good-hearted group that yeah. uh, did quiet things for each community. My own grandfather was a Freemason. My great grandfather was. was. Uh, okay, there you go. So it wasn't like some sort of evil conspiracy going on, some evil society. Not at all. They were good fellows, but they did have an interest in um, astronomy and astrology and uh, life uh, above and beyond the stars. Uh, it's reflected in some of their artwork, including at the Capitol building, which is where one eyewitness said the, um, the recoveries from uh, a UFO crash were stored, and he saw them as pointed out to him by FDR's Secretary of State Cordell Hull. And we can get into that story during the uh, course of this program. Now, I don't know how you want to take this, if you want to just go into kind of what happened with the incident from what you've dug up, or you want to kind of talk to how you gotten in, even involved in it. I mean, but anyway, oh, you know, being in your hometown, I'm sure, had a lot to do with it. But you know, uh, what, what got I you found out in my, yeah, in my hometown, there's plenty of people who have never heard of this, who have um, almost no interest. There's, uh, it's, it's starting to catch on a little bit. But if you go to Cape Girardeau today, anyone listening, there is no museum. There is no official crash site. You might talk to some people. What about that UFO incident? And, and some people will say, yeah, I heard something about that. Uh, the whole thing began to uh, snowball in the late 1990s. A letter written by the granddaughter of Reverend William Huffman uh, began to be researched by uh, some rather famous names in ufology, like uh, investigator Ray Fowler, Leonard Stringfield, Stanton Friedman, uh, mm -hmm. Ryan and Robert Wood, and eventually Linda Moulton Howe brought the uh, show to the national airways on Art Bell's Coast to Coast in 99, 2000. And uh, I began reading and hearing more about, and I wanted to uh, uh, get me a book on this uh, since I was a Cape Girardeau resident for so long, and there is none. So I thought someone should write a book. I'm someone. <laughs> I think I can write. So I uh, put together uh, enough material for Mo 41, the bombshell before Roswell, and it was so well received that they even showed it literally on Ancient Aliens and did a segment in August of last year on uh, the uh, the Cape Girardeau affair. I've seen it. I just used the uh, the, the term Mo 41 as in, in mm -hmm. Missouri 1941, just sort of a, a code word or slang uh, to uh, wrap up the whole uh, affair in one, under one little roof. But uh, I got some more material on my own, did some more snooping around, and I got letters and uh, emails from people who had more information to share. So I put together a second book called Three Presidents, Two Accidents, more, more Mole 41 UFO crash data and surprises. They're still available from Argus Publishing. If you want to go and uh, look those up, you can get them uh, pretty inexpensively on ebooks and uh, electronically, or you can get some physical copies. 
But uh, to get back to the story, uh, let's get down to the goodies. What yeah. exactly happened uh, in, in this uh, farm field outside of town? That's what everyone wants to know. Uh, Reverend Huffman said he got a phone call from a friend who came over and picked him up. He was a police associate, and he took him out to this um, crash site outside of town. He was told they were all thinking that this was an airplane crash. Right. No one had the slightest clue in those days about aliens or spaceships. And uh, they went out there, and they found the fire department fa uh, fighting the flames, the Cape Girardeau Police Department. Some men in military uniforms were there, and the FBI were there, too. And when I first heard this story, I thought, aha, I got the uh, storyteller uh, in a bit of a fib here. There was no FBI in Cape Girardeau in those days. Yeah, it wasn't like they but were a far-reaching network, you know, at right. that point. Uh, but they wouldn't be in a small town right. like Cape Girardeau, right? Well, I found out they were. An article in the Cape Girardeau newspaper indicated just one month before the crash, the FBI had to open up a field office. There was so much... Uh, uh, sabotage and a little bit of spying going on in southeast Germans. Missouri from pro-German, mm -hmm. uh, or rather German pro-Nazi uh, sources. So this became a factor in why um, the police, the FBI, and the military all showed up and told people who showed up, uh, you know, citizens, farmers, first responders, as we would call them today, you did not see this, this never happened, we need to keep this a secret. They wanted to keep information away from pro-Nazi uh, forces. We had a very large German population in Cape Girardeau in those days. So Reverend Huffman uh, walked over to the uh, crash victims. They were all laid out, three of them, in a uh, field next to the uh, burning uh, debris, the shrapnel, and this uh, busted open round silver metal disc. And he looked down, and he was just astounded. He found three small gray aliens, the, your typical grays that we see in uh, popular culture now, with large heads, big black eyes, uh, tiny little dots for nostrils, a little slit for a mouth, really long, thin uh, arms and legs, abnormally long by human standards, and apparently um, uh, three fingers, I think it was, on each hand, and a thumb. And they were very long. Uh, just sort of creepy looking, uh, yeah. according to these sources. So uh, this is mostly from the granddaughter of Reverend Huffman. She put together a family history on this and uh, came forward in the late 1990s, and it's been um, explored, but uh, I'm the first one to research and put it into a published book. Well, Reverend Huffman said his prayers over two deceased aliens, and he found to his surprise the third one was still breathing. Oh, wow. And, and so as he was um, probably getting his Bible out, ready to read a, a little passage over this creature, uh, two men picked up one of the dead ones and propped him up and stretched his arms out and, and posed for a photograph that was taken by a local photographer. There were a couple of newsmen taking big flash photos that would light up the, uh, the whole area, as we see in old movies and maybe mm -hmm. uh, uh, newsreel footage. So uh, there was this resulting photograph taken actually by a small pocket camera instead of the man who took the picture was a local newsman who had a big speed graphic camera. But for this particular posed photo, he brought out a small brownie pocket no, camera. Brownie pop pocket, yep. Right. And then he stuck it back in his pants pocket. And it's a good thing he did because the, uh, the alien that Reverend Huffman was uh, praying over uh, – died in the grass where it was laid out. It just stopped breathing, and it was right. obvious that it was deceased. Reverend Huffman said he made sure not to touch it. So uh, shortly after that, Huffman went over to the spacecraft and was astounded to see it was this silver disc that had blown open, and he could peek inside. I'm sure people had uh, flashlights and lanterns and car headlights lighting up this object, standing around, peeking into it, and he said it had uh, a couple of small seats as if for children, and there was a dashboard with instruments and dials and such, and a silver band around the interior, uh, perhaps the uh, the upper ceiling, uh, with strange symbols on it. He couldn't make this out. He, uh, I hate to say this, but it sounds like your typical spaceship or UFO. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, and but this is before pre-Hollywood, you know. Yeah. And uh, so they swear that this is what he reported seeing. And uh, I, in my research, I found out there was a Cape Girardeau fireman who was dying of cancer some years ago, and he told his family the same story. He said, you know this Reverend Huffman tale of uh, 
the spaceship crash, the whole thing is true. I ought to know. I was there fighting the fire, according to my uh, boss, the fire chief, and we saw the alien bodies, and we saw the United States military arrive, the U.S. Army. They uh, circled the, uh, the site, hemmed everyone in, and said, put down that debris. You're not going to take any souvenirs or samples. You'll not take any notes or photos. We'll take all of this evidence back away from these uh, creatures and these uh, pieces of silver, uh, almost like aluminum foil debris in the spaceship. And you will not talk about this now or ever again. This is a matter of national security. So uh, the fireman said um, he got caught trying to pocket a piece of debris. He stuck it in his pants pocket, and the Army caught him, and they chewed him out, got the piece back, and then they booted him out of the crash site. The man said um, in the aftermath he was sure he was being watched around town, and his phone was tapped. So I looked into that, and it turns out that J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, and FDR were wild about tapping people's phones. Oh, yeah. Phones. Oh, J. Edgar Hoover especially. I mean, he was getting yeah. intel on all kinds of people. Exactly. And this was still uh, against the law, but yeah. the FBI did whatever they pleased oh. in those days, and there was not a lot of congressional or public oversight. If they felt like tapping your phone in the interest of national security new technology. Yeah. or just curiosity or being a busybody, they did so. Uh, FDR, his son later said that uh, FDR used to sit in the White House and go over the transcripts and mm -hmm. laugh about what people were talking about uh, over the phone, that they had no clue that we, they were being wiretapped. So uh, Reverend Huffman said that he was taken aside and, and sworn to secrecy. And I've uncovered uh, a gentleman uh, lately contacted me and said that his grandmother uh, confessed before she died. She was a young girl, about 14. She went down to the Cape Girardeau Church where Reverend Huffman was supposed to be uh, a pastor, but he wasn't there, she stopped by his house on the, the morning after the crash. She said Reverend Huffman was in a distraught state. He was very uh, uh, upset and looked like he'd been awake all night. He said he was, he was, and he confessed to this girl that there was a spaceship crash outside of town and that they'd, uh, the FBI was the one who took him into the back of a military truck along with some firemen, and swore him to secrecy, that they would never discuss this again. So it's kind of amusing that Reverend Huffman uh, did tell somebody. <laughs> he, went, he went home that night and told his family, and then he may have told this 14-year-old uh, girl who stopped by the house and was wondering, why are you so upset? Why do you look so bad? And he may have explained he may have had the very human need to unburden exactly. himself yes. and get this story out before, you know, what if the government comes back and takes him away or kills him? I mean, surely uh, such thoughts had to run through his mind. Yeah, you know that, you know, you talk about the wiretap for one, that, you know, phones hadn't been around for a very long time at that point. I mean, they've been around for, you know, you know, a few decades, but in a very primitive state. And it's just like the Internet today with them, wire, you know, looking at people's emails and stuff. It was a technology the government hadn't caught up yet to the, the legality of it, a wiretap well, of people's phones. Uh, it's certainly a believable story, mm -hmm. and I found out through some research a Cape Girardeau fireman abruptly quit the force within a day or two of the incident, and uh, it was not explained in the paper why, and the uh, Cape Girardeau mayor had to go find a new uh, fireman to replace this man. Uh, it was uh, an unusually warm period in the middle of uh, April of 1941, and that Saturday night, uh, uh, FDR was in the White House, and he was having some company for a dinner. And according to his records, he was strangely up uh, past midnight before he even went to his upstairs quarters. Hmm. That's not like the president, who had uh, uh, polio, and he had uh, other health problems, and right. he usually was uh, in bed before at least 11, maybe 10.30, or even sooner, depending upon how he felt. So there's another uh, red flag that uh, something was up, and once he got up to his quarters, he had two telephones in his room, and he could easily have taken calls and placed calls during the course of the evening. Unfortunately, there are no existing White House yeah. uh, phone records from uh, FDR. Those were probably scrubbed pretty quick yeah. when they yeah. were going through his uh, <laughs> materials for his museum, his library. You mentioned Stanton so, Freeman being one of the people that uh, investigated. I actually saw a lecture with him recently, and he even briefly mentioned this case in his, uh, his lecture. I'm like, yeah. hey, I'm going to have this guy on my show to talk about this, so I've been yeah. really interested. 
for once, there is a subject I know more about uh, than Stanton than Freeman. Stanton he Freeman, came to yep. Cape Girardeau. Uh, <laughs> I bless him. I, I thank him. Uh, he came to Cape, unlike other researchers, or uh, he started doing some digging on his own. So did uh, Ryan Wood, and they mm-hmm. helped uh, put together a 2002 uh, Sci-Fi Channel special, The Secret That uh, We Are Not Alone, and they did about two minutes on Cape Girardeau and recreated uh, the, the image of Reverend Huffman looking at this dead body that was propped up and photographed. And to this day, people make the mistake on the Internet of uh, seeing these still images from this television show and saying, aha, there's this photograph, right. it's right here on the Internet, and I have <laughs> to let them down gently. Uh, no, the existing photograph has never been seen by the public in general. However, the photographer stopped by the Huffman family home about a week or two after the event and said, I've got a copy of this photo. I want you to have a copy. And he seemed scared, and he took off pretty quick because in those days people were worried that they were being watched around town. Uh, It's important to note that Cape Girardeau had a National Guard armory, and a lot of citizens were involved with the Army. Uh, they were loyal and trustworthy citizens, and if they were uh, told by the police department to keep their mouth shut, they would have. And if uh, they heard someone opening their mouth about the case, they might have uh, squealed to uh, the authorities. So there was a lot of fear and maybe paranoia back in those days. If you even talked about this, who wanted to be thought of as uh, a blabbermouth or even as crazy in no, a conservative right. community? I mean, and so, this uh, is, these people have no idea about aliens at this point, anyways. You know, right. like, there's nothing uh, about to be the only about thing it. was like Flash Gordon, yeah. or uh, comic books that occasionally mention the idea. Reverend Huffman uh, gave the photograph to his son, who apparently stuck it in like a drawer somewhere. And a couple of years, the family uh, moved away. And they ended up uh, in a small town in Kansas where the grandparents. Uh, the son and uh, their little girl who was growing up named Charlotte Huffman Mann, uh, at the time just Huffman, uh, used to have family parties. And then we get this photograph out of the alien that was propped up at this uh, crash event. And the little girl saw it and wanted to know, but they, the adults wouldn't talk to her very much about it. They thought it was for the best that it would be an adult subject only. But she did find out that a neighbor across the uh, street came over one night for a dinner party and said, I'd like to see this uh, photograph uh, that they were talking about, an alien being. Right. And he said, I used to work in the Army, and I know something about photography. Let me just take off with this, and I'll bring it right back. And he never did. He took off with the photograph. He left town, literally, wow. and uh, wow. yeah, never showed up again. He was tracked down in the 1990s, around the year 2000. And uh, he was a very old man, and he passed away in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but when they cr- tried to question him about this photo- photograph, he gave various evasive answers. He didn't want to talk about it. He would blow up and get angry. And uh, first he said, oh, I don't have any photograph. I've never seen any photograph. And then he admitted, well, yes, I did, but I gave it back. And, of course, that wasn't true either. So the photograph seems lost to history. That's so sad. And the man uh, who took off with it had an Army intelligence background. Mm-hmm. So we can kind of figure what he did, and that's why he took off entirely uh, to get it uh, to uh, Intel, because uh, in those days uh, it would have been a pretty explosive subject for the military, and certainly the Army did show up that night and tell everyone, keep this to yourselves. Now, what about the photographer who took the, the picture? You know, Do you think he had a, his own copy of it, or he gave the only copy to the family? Well, we don't know his name exactly. Most sources I know pinpoint him as probably a man named Garland Fronebarger, who, in, unbelievably, I'm distantly related to. <laughs> he passed away in the early 1990s. Uh, a lot of his photographs, he took many, many pictures, uh, went up for auction. And my father went to that auction, and now he's, he, uh, before he passed away, my dad said, I was just kicking myself that I didn't look more thoroughly at uh, his oh, collection. Yeah. But it seems unlikely he would be right. allowed to put these alien pictures that he took uh, if they were even um, not he, taken away by the Army. Well, or he gave it to a family member, said, here, yeah, hold on uh, to this. Got, it might be important one day. Uh, yeah, I tracked down his son. He was still alive in Arizona. And he says uh, he was familiar with the case. Uh, he saw something on TV. 
but he said his father did not talk to him about it. However, he said my dad was secretive about some things and talkative about others, so it's at least possible. Right. And I've got another source who told me, uh, absolutely, uh, Garland Fronebarger was there taking pictures that night. Uh, so uh, it really looks like uh, he did, but uh, if he mentioned it to anyone, it would have been very foolhardy, and apparently he kept his mouth shut. Uh, he had a job for uh, like many decades, like 50 years in the local newspaper business, and if you want to keep your job, you would keep your mouth shut in right. a small town like that. Well, you wonder if he gave them the only copy because he just wanted to be done with it. You know, uh, I well, tried to contact the people who live in his house now in Cape Girardeau and right. say, "Could you search the attic or you know the basement Four or words. any sort of <laughs> yeah, any uh, air conditioning duct or yeah. uh, fire or uh, not fire escape, but uh, any uh, pipes or uh, a little cubby right. hole in the basement." Uh, I did not hear back from them. Maybe they thought I was a little loony, but uh, <laughs> you would think he would store away somewhere in a safety deposit box a copy of uh, this historic yeah. photo that he managed to snuggle out uh, away from the Army when they came in. He had that pocket camera in his pocket, and they never said anything to him, so he didn't tell them. And that's how he got away with uh, getting this picture, and he likely devel developed himself or gave it to someone he, know, he knew and uh, had it developed. So uh, Charlotte Mann uh, described uh, the picture as, a, once again, a, a bulbous-headed gray alien with his arms stretched out and really creepy dark black eyes. And if you've ever seen on the Internet uh, something called uh, Skinny Bob, yeah, it's uh, I see alien the picture footage, your, black your, and white. Yeah, yeah, it's really creepy. It is. Uh, that creature was apparently filmed by Russian KGB mm -hmm. operatives in 1942, about a year after the Cape Girardeau crash, and it matches exactly. I mean, the fingers on the hand, the bulbous head, the big black eyes, it moves around, its head even pulses a little bit, and his eye blinks. It is one spooky uh, piece of footage. It may be the, the real deal, and I'm I've a never been able person. To, I've never been able to make my mind up on it. I mean, I'm no expert to make up my mind on it anyways. Right. But, you know, with uh, the, I know CG, and I know computer graphics, right. and I know the magic that can happen. Uh, we have to be very careful mm -hmm. of frauds these days and computer uh, imagery, but a man uh, on the Internet wrote in uh, very persuasively various reasons why this was not CGI, yeah. because he works with CGI, and yeah, uh, they researched, let's, let's say, the KGB logo at the start of the footage, and it was authentic. It checked out, yeah. and the graininess of the film, and so... Uh, uh, if you want to see what may well have come crashing to Earth uh, in uh, just outside Cape Girardeau, Missouri, go to that footage of Skinny Bob taken by the Russians a year later. A lot that of people tout it. A lot of people really believe that it's the real deal. I, you know, there's nobody that's I've seen come out and say, you know, I can prove it's fake right here. I've not seen anybody do that. You know, with it. So yeah, not as far as I know. Uh I'm not an expert, but I, I do come from a rather cynical family. I don't believe everything I'm told or see, and so we find out so many frauds, especially in oh, ufology, yeah. as we call it. But that may be the real deal. It, it, it's, and it's curious, you know, 1941, they crash in the U.S. As you said, Skinny Bob, 1942, they crash in Russia. Right. You know, and I mean, this is the middle of, you know, war for Russia at that point. Um, yeah, the Russians were involved with Nazi Germany uh, in '42, and we became involved <laughs> rather strangely. Japan attacked us in mm. Pearl, the Pearl Harbor attack, and like the next day, the Nazis declared war on us, which uh, many people feel was an extremely foolish maneuver uh, oh, yeah. that uh, yeah. brought about the ruin of Nazi Germany. It, yep. Oh yeah, I love history. I love World War II history. I've watched, you know watched a ton of documentaries, read a ton on it, and uh, it's interesting what's going on. And what we was going to get to is you know we talk about the crash landing in the U.S., the crash landing in Russia during this time, and World War II, and then the Nazis supposedly might have had their own crash landing too, and we're trying to reverse engineer UFO technology. Uh, I don't believe the Aurora, Texas incident of 1897 turned out to be truly alien. Uh, that may be controversial to some people, but I think the 1941 Cape Girardeau crash really was America's first. Uh, I know Kevin Randall and uh, another uh, UFO, Bill, um, oh, I forget his last name, Bill Burns, 
uh, who, who ran a TV show, UFO Hunters, both looked into Aurora, Texas, and said, "There's nothing alien here. This was yeah. a man-made crash." Yeah, I've heard a lot of people so, say uh, that. They are eager to find UFO cases, but even they said that wasn't the real deal. So yeah. we have to look at Cape Girardeau as the first one. But remember, the biggest thing was the 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 fact that you know a newspaper the, the the newspapers back then the way that they ran in you know was, you know late 1800s was they would make up just like clickbait now <laughs> they would make yeah. up sensational stories and put it in the uh, papers sell papers country folks would tell tall tales mm -hmm. or exaggerate something and a reporter would uh, sensationalistic yellow journalism back then and they put most anything in for the most part you didn't sue you just had to put up with it if they printed something that you knew wasn't true especially about yourself so uh, I, I don't know of any other news accounts in this country uh, very uh, carefully and clearly showing a UFO crash, although there certainly were sightings of strange objects maybe for thousands of years. Oh, yeah. We, you know, we get to the ancient alien scene and all the, the stuff that, show, you know, they have mm -hmm. paintings, religious paintings of UFOs. But, uh, you know, to me, what's interesting about this, you know, is the time period of, like I said, 1941 for this, 1942 for Skinny Bob. And at the same time, there's always been reports that Nazis also had in Germany a UFO crash. And we're trying to reverse engineer it. It's like three of the major powers involved in this all had these beings crash land in their spots and... You know, 75 years later, at least for us and probably for Russia, have we reverse engineered some of that technology? Well, people will ask me, come on, Paul, they're advanced extraterrestrials, and yet they keep crashing all over the place. And I say, <laughs> we've got uh, pilots who know all about air pressure and uh, the uh, geomagnetic pull of the Earth and weather fronts and all of our uh, best planes, and we still have crashes to this day. Mm -hmm. If you're an alien, you're from another world, you don't understand these forces and our weather and such, you could easily come here to go poking around and looking around and have an accident. So mechanical error, pilot error, weather-related error, I don't know what caused the uh, Mo 41 affair, why this thing came crashing down, but... Uh, it did, and other crashes have occurred. We've read and heard so many stories, you can't believe everything you hear, but I think the Cape Girardeau case holds up really well. Uh, there's also, I'm, I'm, my memory's slipping to me, there's also the, um, was the Aztec case, too, which would have been later. Yeah, like 1948 Aztec, yeah. was it Arizona or New Mexico, I forget. I can't remember. I'm and, of course, Roswell was July of 1947. Yeah. And in doing a little uh, work uh, research on uh, just that, I was looking at Harry Truman's presidential um, daily logs, and it said that the governor of Missouri in 1941 had become a senator, and he was called into Harry's office around the time of the UFO crash in Roswell. Now, is that a coincidence, or right. uh, did he go to, like, an expert and uh, talk to someone who might have known? A governor would have been in charge of uh, sheriff's reports and assigning people in uh, county government. And by some accounts, the, the Cape County Sheriff may well have been at the uh, Mo 41 affair. He had a brother who was in the Army aerial training program in nearby Sykeston, Missouri. And some people will say, well, how could the military have shown up so fast? Sykeston's about 30, 35 miles down the road from Cape Girardeau. So if the sheriff had gotten to the crash scene early, he would have called his brother in the Army aerial program, and they would have sent some people up just about the timing. About two hours later, Reverend Huffman said they came in uh, and uh, took over the site and uh, eventually swore them off, and he went home to his family, and he was so shaken, he told them the big story that night, uh, breaking his oath right away, uh, his <laughs> oath of silence, and then he kept quiet for the rest of his life, and he died in 1959 without uh, raising a fuss about this issue. Well, it's like you said, it's human nature. You just switch, witness something incredible. Right. you got to tell somebody. you got to tell. you right. right got to tell somebody. You can't just hold that in, you know, but you know, unless you're made of weird stuff, different stuff than I am, man. But I'd have to tell somebody right away, you know, like there's just no way. I mean, that's the first thing you do. I mean, you heard people talk about, I just saw, you know, I saw a UFO. They usually run into the house or tell their family members, you know, it's, you know, when you see something that's out of this world, you just can't hold that in. Not, not, I not interviewed right an older woman who's passed away since then, uh, but she said a few years ago, 
Oh, I heard the adults talking about this when I was like 10 or 11 years old. Uh-huh. They said a little uh, spaceship, an outer space ship had crashed, and these little people were found. And uh, she said, we didn't have terms like UFO and ET and alien. Right. She said, they just called them little people that had been found on this farm. So that uh, confirms to me once again in a small way, but a substantial way from an actual citizen who remembers uh, the adults talking about it at the time. And, and I just can't picture, uh, you know, this person, she was 10 years old, back when she had to be in her late 70s, 80s. Yeah, she must have been around 80 when I right. spoke to her. Well, what an 80-year-old woman now. is just going to sit there and make that up about yeah. her family and stuff? I mean, seriously, I mean, think about it. Who, who, who's just going to make that up, an 80-year-old right. woman, just to, just to make it up? You know? Even to this day, there are people who might be so cynical or closed-minded that they think you're crazy. If you say you've seen a spaceship uh, fly by or some lights in the sky or uh, you heard about an alien crash secondhand, they'll still still call you nuts. So yeah. well, who wants that? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure it's when people get later in their life they don't care anymore. You know, what, nobody, you know That's her, right. She you know, what, what can the think. government do to me? I'm 85 years mm-hmm. old. I don't give a hoot anymore. And that's a <laughs> sad thing. This happened so long ago. The people that saw it are dead, and the and their children are dead. That's right. That's, <laughs> I try to point that out in my book that uh, it's tough to research when generations are going by now and the story is dying off. Yeah, well, Roswell, a lot of people think people have known about Roswell for so long. No. It really wasn't until Staten Freeman and a few other investigators really looked into it in the the 80s. It really was not really known very well. Well, there was a fascinating UFO crash outside of Las Vegas in April of 1962, 21 years after the Cape Girardeau affair. And even I'm having trouble finding it. I'm sure there's almost everyone from that era is deceased now, too. I have this story within my new book called Sexy Alien Races that has just come out. It's a uh, fictional story with lots of factual Nevada-based UFO tales. I love the cover for it. I gave it to Jeff, my engineer, who's playing, put, showing pictures up on the video. If he gets it, Jeff, see, there should be a picture of the, uh, the book cover you sent me. Sexy alien, it's called Sexy Alien Races, right? Right. I, I it's about that. a young man who uh, creates some alien costume mascots at a baseball park. He has to learn about actual aliens in order to create these to win over his boss. And they decide to sort of sex them up a little to get people into the ballpark. The more ludicrous and outlandish they look, the more attendance they get. And that's why you have the name Sexy Alien Races. <laughs> yeah, this is a fictional book, but it, it's alone still right. about aliens, you know. Um, but it, it's interesting, though, you know, like we, we go these, you know, nowadays, it's like when, when's the UFO crash going to happen again where – there's witnesses in public and cell phone cameras, you know, that's what yeah. I'm waiting for. Because back then, I mean, it really, you know, like for, the, you know, this incident in Missouri, I, I mean, how many people you think were there, at, for instance, in this one that were at the actual crash site in total, not counting any of the military, just the civilians that were there? Civilians, not counting the military, maybe 15 to 20 people, so uh, are, including the police, the fire department, the farmer and his family. Uh, one woman uh, came forward and said, I talked to a farmhand who was there. He was the one who saw the initial crash, the fireball. He ran into the farmhouse and placed the call to the city operator who contacted uh, the various authorities. And uh, this man talked about it only later in life, and then he passed away. So uh, it, it, once again, confirming little details about how this could have happened, probably on a Saturday night uh, when a lot of people were off the farm and in town, uh, maybe going to the movies or shopping, and uh, this left uh, a fewer people in the countryside. But Cape Girardeau has so many good-hearted citizens that I'm sure many people rushed to the scene quickly, thinking uh, the initial report oh, of crash. an airplane yeah. crash would have brought them out to uh, and really help fill up the place. Well, uh, it could have been more than 20 people eventually. True. I mean, well, it's like Hexburg. You know, they thought that they, right. they, everybody saw it in the sky, and everybody in the town was trying to get a look at it. You know, but if it was just 15 or 20 people, the amount of information, and, and all of them were told to keep their mouth shut in a time when people did what their government told them to do, you know, they they, did, and they all just a little bit told each of their family members, then it would be just just a small segment of that population over the years that would know about it or talk about it. It would always be that underlying 
urban myth that only a few people know about and gets spread from word of mouth here and there, but not too much, you know, because it's just between the families that were involved in this. I was further surprised by some information that was brought to me that a conservative, politically active family in Cape Girardeau uh, had some uh, of their sons uh, a, couple, a decade or so ago talk about their parents said a secondary crash or some material came down in their front yard Ooh. and that they had to call the police. And I wanted to know more about this, but the political uh, connected family does not want to talk about it. Even to this day, they don't want to upset the apple cart or be thought of as a little loopy, you know, like space cadets. But in talking to uh, Linda Moulton Howe about the uh, 1947 Roswell crash, there was more than one uh, craft that came down like yeah, a mile that. or two away was uh, something that uh, experts believe was probably uh, an expelled um, emergency craft like um, an escape pod. Uh, escape pod, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. So we can uh, speculate reasonably so that uh, this material about a mile away from Cape Girardeau that came down in a yard was a smaller escape type pod, maybe even empty. Maybe it uh, ejected uh, automatically. Or, yeah, or and that's why there away. were bodies found at the site. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I you know, you just I, one of my favorite. Um, I, did you ever see the uh, Steven Spielberg Taken uh, miniseries? Uh, no, I didn't get a chance to you see should, that. If you ever able to, I know it's probably hard to find out because it's been years ago. It was a TV miniseries, and they, they did Roswell, and they did it wrong. But it was really interesting you, just to see, you know, when the, I, I have to admit, I do like Steven Spielberg. Uh, the way that they did it in the, the miniseries with, it was families like that. Only the families that were the witnesses of this event, you know, they, like one was a general and his family got powerful within the secret military organization. The other families were, end up being abductees and it was, no. it, it's just, it's weird. It's interesting. It's just that the, the people that were witnesses, they, they're the tale, tellers of the tale, and only their family members are the ones that really get to pass it along because there's no f record. Just south of Cape Girardeau is a small town called Chaffee, and a couple of people I talked to from Chaffee knew all about the Cape Girardeau crash. They also know a young lady who lived there for a few years, and her name was Kate Capshaw. She was the daughter-in-law of Chaffee's mayor. She eventually had a, a movie career, and she married Steven Spielberg. Yeah. She she had a daughter who's now famous, uh, Jessica Capshaw, an actress in her own right, that she shared with her first husband. So she and Steven Spielberg probably went back and forth to uh, the Cape Girardeau Airport and Chaffee and picking up and dropping off in the days of uh, the custody for this young lady. And he may well have driven right past the Cape Girardeau UFO farm. It was... Uh, the road between Cape and Chaffee and the airport all is in the same area. And I don't know what Steven Spielberg knows about Mo 41. I'd like to know. Right. But I do know uh, he had the uh, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, in which uh, the villainous of the movie said there were other crashes besides You're Roswell. Right. You're and, right. You're uh, right. This is Spielberg's baby. He, he yep. set the uh, dialogue for this. So oh, yeah. you really are curious. What does he know? And he doesn't say much. Yeah, I mean, close encounters of the third kind. I mean, they kind of alluded to that too. You know that the government knew, you know, about these aliens, and of course, those aliens yep. in that movie look just like the aliens from Missouri, nineteen forty-one or Mo forty-one. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was um, a Spielberg connection, maybe in another movie. It, it, oh, I, I know. Uh, I was going to tell the story that uh, there's this rumor in UFO circles for many years that uh, Steven Spielberg went to the White House and screened E.T. for President Reagan. Yes, I've heard And of that. just after the screening, uh, President Reagan said, you don't know how true this movie is. I like your impression. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, just a few years ago, Steven Spielberg confirmed these rumors are true, that Reagan did say this and mm -hmm. he was dead serious. So uh, Reagan knew some things, too. And he was in and out of Cape Girardeau in the 70s and 80s as uh, a president of the United States. He visited Cape Girardeau. He had a UFO. Uh, landed too. right near the airport there. Uh, Reagan witnessed a UFO, too. I've heard that. He yeah. and his uh, pilot, the pilot spoke about it later, that they were very serious and uh, they wanted to talk about it. But once again, they're political conservatives, and this is kind of over the heads of other people who don't want to be thought of as a little spacey or oh, yeah. uh, getting carried away. 
But you're talking about the president that more than once in a speech said, what if an alien race came to evade us? Would we put our differences aside, you know? Right. Uh, a number, you know, at least three times, I think, he, he did that speech. Uh, he did. He waited till he got a second term as president and began uh, talking about these things. And I think someone got to him and said, stop mentioning aliens, <laughs> because he did. And uh, it's uh, very sad that he contracted the Alzheimer's, which yeah. he may have had in his last year or so as president. Yeah. But he had it so badly in his uh, retirement, he could not speak uh, uh, intelligently on the subject. Yeah, I'm, I have a family that's been hit with Alzheimer's. Uh, and it, it's awful what it does to a yeah. person. And we wouldn't uh, have any chance of getting that information after he was left to president. I think he, I, I do think he had it at the very end of his presidency, it seems like he might have. In the 2016 campaign, Jeb Bush ran for president, and he brought out his father, former President H, uh, George H.W. Bush. And at an event, um, uh, a young man spoke up and said, what can you tell us about UFOs? Are these things real or not? And... Uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush snapped back, I know some things, I've read some things, and I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and they hustled the guy who asked the question right out of the building. They got rid of him real fast. He didn't want to talk about it, the former president, but he admitted he knows some things. There are things that are being kept from the American public, and it's kind of scary in that uh, maybe the government knows uh, we're not only being observed, but maybe threatened or something like this behind the scenes. It's George W. Bush was on a talk show, and he basically said as so many words as that. <laughs> yeah. That, that he, you know, well, I knew, I couldn't tell you. Yep. And Dick Cheney. And uh, they asked Bill Clinton <laughs> the same thing yep. on, like, Jimmy Kimmel. Can you please tell us about the UFOs? And he gave a roundabout answer and said, well, I'm, you know, I really can't tell you. And so there's something there, and they're not talking, and... You have to hope that uh, someone like President Trump, who is not from the military, he's not a career politician, he wasn't in uh, intelligence circles, maybe somehow he'll be a wild card and release information at last and let the American public judge it for ourselves, but I'm not holding my breath. Not holding my breath either, but it is interesting. Recently he said... He turned to the media and he said, this is the calm before the storm, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, what, what are you storm, talking about? Please. <laughs> yes, that's a little frightening there. Yeah, like, don't do that as president. you got to imagine there's some face palming going on from his aides. <laughs> like, oh, dude. Oh, Well, no. that's an example of how he will blurt out something right. that they shouldn't. Yeah, he should not. And so we have a little bit of hope that maybe he right. will talk about uh, reports <laughs> that he's seen on the uh, extraterrestrials visiting uh, Earth and possibly crashing and leaving behind About the only guy I see coming out of this presidency is maybe the possibility of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a question that does, it's a legitimate question. Why would aliens send out, let's say, a scout team and just leave their bodies and the crash and not come back for them? Recover them, right. Yeah, uh, it would have been of great value. You would have wanted to have kept them out of the hands of curious human beings. They're not supposed to have this material. I'm sure people at the Cape Girardeau site were looking around in, in the woods and in the sky above thinking, are there more coming? Are we being invaded? I'm sure that was the first military reaction. A fear. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people were yeah. afraid. Right. Uh, President Roosevelt on upwards uh, it, with the information on uh, Cape Girardeau and Harry Truman with Roswell, it makes you think, uh, are we being scouted for a possible invasion? I don't think that is the case at all. I think aliens are more advanced than that, and they're just poking around with uh, great curiosity, as scientists do here on Earth. But um, I would sure like to hear a fuller explanation from someone in charge. Yeah. Well, I would. Uh, I, let's hope that's the way. We do got to go to our uh, last commercial break here. So, when we come back, we're going to talk about. I want to talk to you about um, where did some of this? Where did the alien ship end up? Right, Patterson, Area Fifty One. You know, the the conversation. We're going to go there, but you can also call in and ask Paul some questions. We've got two Skype lines, Soup Live Chat, 100 Live Chat CID, or OOJ Bland OO. When we come back from the break, you can go ahead and call in the show and ask Paul a question if you got one. All right, guys, be back with you in just a minute.
tonight we have guest Paul Blake Smith, author of MO41, The Bombshell at Roswell. He's got a new book, Sexy Alien Races. I love that title. <laughs> We're talking about the Missouri 1941 crash. This is pre-Roswell. Not a lot of people know about it. Paul's written the only books on it. Um, it's just so interesting to hear a stories that have come that he's had to research, talk to people, you know, you know, all these people that saw it are dead, their children are probably dead, but it, it takes a lot of digging to find out this stuff. And to find out these people, the stories he's hearing, this is stuff that's passed down before there was the Hollywood, you know, well, close encounters of the third kind influence. You know, there was there was no influence on these people in 1941. They got to imagine what it was like to see something. They had no comprehension of what they were even looking at. Uh, and, you know, today if a UFO crash like this, you know, cell phones, people know, oh, that's a gray alien. You know, it, it, it was a different time period, and it's a, it's so interesting. Me. Now you can call into the show tonight to ask Paul questions if you want. Keep them short though. Leave room for us to talk and other people call in. There's two Skype IDs. There's a Soup Live Chat 800 live chat we can see you by video on that call in line the other skype id is audio only it's o o j b l a n d o o that's o o j b l a n d o o the phone line is down tonight though that won't be working so don't call in on the the, the phone line that that's out so all right guys be right here back with you in just a sec You still there with us, Paul? I'm right here. Awesome. Now, when we left for the break, uh, one of the things I was curious, you know, of course, this is pre-Area 51. Uh, the, the most time when people talk about, uh, even for Area 50, or for Roswell, the, the crash vehicle ended up at Wright-Patterson. At least that's what they say for Roswell. At one point, that's where the, at least the bodies went, was Wright-Patterson. Do you think that was kind of the same scenario back in 1941 with the, the Missouri crash? It's possible. Things were so terribly crude compared to today's standards. There was no CIA. There was no Pentagon. The Army worked out of the War Department back in those days. And uh, where would you take a crash where you want it protected and you want to investigate it uh, uh, away from the prying eyes of the public and you also don't want aliens to find out about where you've hidden it? Well, there were two sisters. Uh, they were elderly women who sh spoke up in the 1990s. And they said their father, Reverend Turner Holt, since passed away, had told them the story individually, both of them, that he was visiting Washington, D.C., and Secretary of State Cordell Hull, Reverend Holt's cousin, they oh. were cousins, uh, said, I want to show you something. You can't talk about it. It's a big secret. So he took them way downstairs, like seven stories below the, uh, the surface level of the Capitol building which turned out to be quite true that there are many, many stories to the uh, Capitol building down below in the ground. Uh, it was built that way quite special by Freemasons who hold the building quite uh, revered. It's even on the cover of their literature to this day. Mm -hmm. Well, Cordell Hole showed off in a secret uh, vaulted room uh, a crashed disc that had been cut into sections. It was circular and gray, just like the Cape Girardeau crash, and blown open in one area, just like the Mo 41 affair. They showed off a box of silver shrapnel, uh, the strange metal, and three dead aliens uh, encased in three glass jars uh, floating in uh, uh, what might have been um, formaldehyde, mm -hmm. and they matched exactly the Cape Girardeau affair. Uh, they were big-headed with the long, thin arms and legs and big black eyes most assuredly deceased, with no visible injuries on the outer part of their skin, their epidermis. And that's what they said at Cape Girardeau. They were dead, yet they couldn't figure out exactly why. Uh, so it's interesting to note that um, Secretary Hull said, uh, we can't talk about this, but these are creatures from another world. He worked directly for FDR. And I found out through a little research, uh, strangely enough, Cordell Hull had himself buried down below the surface of uh, uh, the street level uh, in a church in Washington, D.C. as well, uh, in a crypt down below. I don't know what the significance of that is, but uh, these bodies and everything match the alien affair. Uh, from what we can uh, assess now very reasonably, it was around 1941. Everything fits together 
that uh, the, the Missouri uh, recoveries must have been taken by the Army and, and stashed. It was during the a April um, Passover Easter holiday when there was no one around the Capitol. It was completely deserted. Uh, everyone was away on their break. All the congressmen and their uh, senators and representatives and their staff were back in their hometowns pressing the flesh. And uh, so the place would have been perfect for smuggling in something, let's say, at night and taking it down the elevator and putting it in this special locked room. And I'll just add real quick, on 60 Minutes within the last year, they did a story about pulling out the special 9-11 uh, crash report from uh, 2001 and what Congress had dug up. And 60 Minutes showed this special vaulted room, uh, the double doors, and down a hall. They weren't allowed to go inside. Uh, well below the Capitol building. And uh, I'm wondering, was that it? Was that the special right. goody room, the treasure room, if you might call it that? So uh, these uh, slices of the story add up. Uh, it's interesting to note also that in so many uh, recovered UFO documents that you can find on MajesticDocuments.com, Ryan Wood's website, mentioned Dr. Van Ever Bush, a scientist well regarded by FDR to work on uh, military projects and create technology to protect America. I looked it up, and Dr. Van Ever Bush just happens to uh, show up in the Oval Office about three or four days after the Cape Girardeau a crash, and uh, he showed up with uh, the, the president's personal physician in a closed-door session, according to the records. And Ryan Wood told me that would, that would make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bush would have been there. Uh, asked by FDR to run an autopsy of the ship, and Dr. McIntyre was a physician who would have been in charge of the autopsy of the bodies. All of this uh, quite hush-hush. So um, the pieces all fit together there as well. Dr. Bush went on to uh, be involved in uh, the Roswell examination uh, and maybe Wright Patterson Air Force Base, which remains a possibility eventually. I think once the heat died down, you would have taken them out from underneath the Capitol and gotten them into the hands of the military at maybe right. Fort Belvere in Washington, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and maybe New Mexico, where they had the uh, fledgling uh, uh, Los Alamos scientific lab down there. So that would be the best guess that I would have. But it's still so darn sketchy because records were withheld or destroyed and people have passed away that uh, could have told us. Well, you know, one thing I find interesting about this, too, um, is, you know, 1947, for the Roswell case, a lot of people cite, well, that was right after the bomb, and that was our only air bomber group was at the Roswell base that carried, you know, nuclear, or, well, yeah, it would be a nuclear warhead. And the aliens were interested in that. Well, 1941's pre-atomic bomb. You wonder right. whatever they It was under construction at the time. Right. They hadn't even uh, gotten very far, and you wonder yep. if possibly the Cape Girardeau recovery and its uh, nuclear propulsion, uh, propulsion system uh, could have been copied and used in our technology. That's the claim that I go into right. in one of my books, and it's uh, a little complicated, but it's, uh, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? Yeah, this, I mean, I haven't read your book. I, I, I want to now. Big time, uh, but that's my first. Well, yeah. what my first thoughts about it being, you know, that time period is, you know, did we back engineer a little bit, you know, make a crude version, and that's how it, you know, I mean, of course, it, you know, Einstein, you know, his famous letter, you know, to Roosevelt about, you know, we need to do this. He, he totally regretted making that letter, writing that letter later. You know, we knew about the possibility, obviously, through science and through Einstein, and that that was a possibility, but could this crash have given the technological kickstart to actually do it? Uh, Dr. Edward Teller uh, mm -hmm. wrote a letter to President Reagan. It's within uh, MajesticDocuments.com, and he mentions this line. He says, 1939, two years before a captured UFO, and they're talking about technology and what was uh, done about it and replicated and such. Right. So what, hey, there's a, a blazing example right there. There was a man who retired from the CIA and Army Intelligence. His name was Thomas Cantwheel, and he typed up a memo before he passed away. And in the memo, one of the first things he says is, I want to tell you that the American government got their hands on a crashed aerodyne, is what he used, an mm -hmm. old-fashioned term, uh, he said in Missouri in 1941, this is one of the biggest secrets he wanted to get off his chest, that the whole story is true, and here's a government source 
Who said so? Uh, there's another tale going around about a German scientist who was working with American scientists in uh, around 1962 at a uh, nuclear uh, detonation site out in Nevada. They were going to run an atomic test. And another uh, man there, they were playing cards, waiting for the detonation to go off. And he said, how did we come up with this technology anyway? And the German scientist says, oh, we were helped by this uh, spaceship that crashed in Missouri. Uh, and they said, another, what? Another <laughs> piece of evidence right <laughs> there. Yeah. And this would have been uh, far be before the public was informed of mm -hmm. this, back in 62. And the man said, there was a spaceship crash in the Ozarks, and we took that technology, and it helped us uh, refine our atomic technology that we use to this day. And he didn't want to talk about it beyond this. But obviously, this was the Cape Girardeau crash. It would make you think, too, if the aliens knew that, then they also feel maybe partly responsible for this nu the nuclear arms race, and maybe that's right. why they and paid so much attention to it. We hear so many stories that uh, alien crafts or disks, objects cylindrical in shape or uh, round, have been hovering over atomic sites and disarming our nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. Yep. Uh, at silos and military bases over the past few decades. Well, this makes more sense yeah. if we copied their own technology and put it into our weapon system. Now we know why they would be able to disable it because we all about stole it. their stuff. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Ed, Gerardo. You, you mentioned Edward Teller. When you mentioned that, it makes me think of another famous UFO, uh, UFO mythology case. Is not is a lot more recent. Is Bob Lazar. Because he was recruited by, according to him, of course, he was recruited by Edward Teller at Los right. Alamos. You know, uh, uh, Bob Lazar, and I mentioned him in my uh, sexy alien races since his story was from the Nevada area. Yeah, he lived there. Uh, he claimed that he at one point was not only working on reverse engineering and trying to understand a recovered alien craft, which was intact, by the way, not crashed mm -hmm. in any way, but that he was shown a briefing book and information on gray aliens from, I believe, Zeta Reticuli. And uh, it, it just spooked him, creeped him out, the, the, some images and information that he read. And how did we manage to get this technology from them, especially if it was not damaged, that there apparently had been technology exchanges over the years. A deal made, so, that's what a lot of people think. Right, so the Mo 41 affair may have kicked all of this off because we captured one of their craft for the first time, and it may have opened up some line of secret communication uh, over the next few decades in which we got uh, information and uh, technology in exchange for our own information and technology. Who knows? One thing, too, you talked about, um, you know, them seeing, you know, the... The, the, the craft that could have been the MO-41 craft being a, 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 a disc, right? Um, the Roswell crash, from most reports, it wasn't a disc. It was almost like a flying wing or a V shape. Right, right? I've seen the images of that. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's different than the MO-41. And, you know, they right. talk about other different kinds of alien races. I actually, doing my research into, I've always, since I was a kid, been interested in this, um, one of the things I've always known about Roswell is most of the descriptions of the aliens from Roswell don't actually, are not really like, they're similar, but not totally like the gray aliens. I glad, I'm glad you brought that up. I quite agree. There are some similarities, but they're different skin tone, maybe slight change in the, the size and maybe the head size. Like these may have been cousins of the uh, Missouri aliens. They were more uh, ch cherub-like. Yeah, we have to keep in mind that uh, undoubtedly these creatures were uh, kept inside a conditioned aircraft and it broke open and they were subject to our oxygen-rich atmosphere. And this probably caused them to stop breathing yeah. and it may have changed their skin color or the crinkliness of their uh, epidermis and uh, maybe their... Uh, nostrils or uh, nasal cavities, etc. You never know what uh, an alien uh, physiology is going to react to our own conditions here on Earth. It's not their planet. They're not accustomed to this. Yeah. They were not expecting to be outside their ship. Uh, we do have a caller on the line. we got our regular, very knowledgeable caller who always has great questions, Zach, on the line. How are you doing tonight, Zach? I'm doing pretty good, Jason. How you doing, brother? Doing really good. you have a question for a guest? You always have such great questions. Um, I, I just have two questions. Um, Paul, it's very nice to meet you, man. Um, I, I loved hearing uh, your recounts of uh, Cam Gerardo and all that. 
And, and my first question, it might seem very off the wall, but I just it, I, I just want your opinion on this. Um, when we hear many stories like Camp Dorado or Roswell, a lot of these UFO crashes tend to be in more rural areas. They're not in any kind of major metropolitan areas. Right. In your research and in, and in your own opinion, do you personally feel that many maybe of these crashes were – I guess coordinated or they were set up to happen. Um, why or why not? I don't have any information that would corroborate that theory. So often uh, they do seem to crash out in rural areas where aliens could have been poking about, looking around, maybe even taking samples of our flora and fauna, our farm animals, livestock, uh, without being seen. Uh, mm -hmm. you, if you're trying to keep on the lowdown, you wouldn't go over a major city, or even Cape Girardeau, population 20,000 back then, uh, there was uh, some amount of cattle farms then, and to this day, if you are involved in uh, cattle mutilation, not one of my favorite subjects, uh, <laughs> there was no evidence of this in the Cape Girardeau crash, to my knowledge, but it would have been a place you would have gone. Uh, it's just that the vast majority of land in America, uh, at least back in the 40s, was rural and not uh, metropolitan. As we know it, big cities today. You got to think. Okay, cool. Oh, go ahead, Zach. Sorry. That's oh, all right. Go ahead. Oh no, go right ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. Well, I said you got to think. You know, like you said, they're going to fly somewhere that's going to be rural. Um, nowadays, you know, there's not as much land or population. You got to wonder if, um, you know, you know, Zach. I know what Zach get, was getting at is like, you know, did they purposely crash land to make contact? I've never thought that. I always thought especially for them being so far back then, it's just that they were flying out in the no man's land because they needed to make sure they were never to be seen. No interference. Like the, they have the prime directive, do not interfere with earthlings. Uh, I agree. Star Trek like mm -hmm. uh, prime directive exactly. that uh, you're supposed to observe. And yet what did they do on Star Trek each week? Go ahead and break that rule yeah, and, and get involved with uh, various races they would encounter. <laughs> well, that's Kirk, man. Kirk's the man. Do that. <laughs> they had to have some episode and some excitement, didn't right. they? <laughs> Zach, thumb, uh, your, thumb your nose at those rules and let's get involved <laughs> with these people and speak to them directly and mess up their culture. Uh, I bet uh, gray aliens really don't want to make contact with humans. Right. I mean, to this day we hear about uh, sightings or crashes, but they still don't come forward. So that's an example of why they might have remained rural and uh, out of sight back then and to this day. And like, well, except for the abductions. <laughs> They're getting very personal and closer, but at least they get, it's on their terms, I'm guessing. Zach, you have a, uh, another question. I know you do. Um, yeah, it's just one more question. Um, I did have a question earlier that I was thinking of. Uh, it was a theory that apparently um, that circulated around that claims that President since Kennedy really haven't been kept in the loop regarding UFO activity. Um, as you guys mentioned before, I mean, presidents up to Reagan and Bush Sr. have been kept in the loop. But my question to you, Paul, is um, does the amount of information that a current president receives – um, on current UFO sightings, is it the equivalent of what previous presidents had received before in other administrations? And in addition to that, which president from your research probably received the most information on UFO sightings? You can go to YouTube and see an actual video clip from the summer of 1952 in which Harry Truman admits, oh, yes, we've always had UFOs and Seen whatnot, it. those spaceships flying around. Uh, I asked the military uh, at every conference. He says, we discussed this at every conference. It's an astounding video, mm -hmm. and uh, you can catch this under President Truman blurts out the truth about aliens. I think he knew plenty oh, yeah. compared to all of our other presidents about the Cape Girardeau affair at the time and when he became president, Roswell and maybe Aztec and other uh, crash sites that uh, started happening. Uh, Linda Moulton House, a very good source to go to on that. Uh, I don't know how much a president is uh, briefed on this information today. I know that's not much of an exciting answer. I'm just not too uh, in the loop about what, let's say, uh, Obama and Trump uh, have been told, and does the military continue to keep secrets from them? It's an interesting thought that uh, they keep it from the public, and the president only serves for a few years, four years maybe, and then they're out of office. In some cases, you might say, why should we tell this guy anything? 
he might be a, a, a threat to blab once he gets out of office. Yeah. So they may not tell him too much. Oh, yeah. You, they're, they're, they're human. They're people. Or maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, like Harry Truman <laughs> blabbed. <laughs> right. Well, actually, I think Jeff's got the video. Jeff, go ahead and play the audio if you got that. He's, my, my trusty video engineer might have it. <laughs> You know, ain't him. But uh, thank you, Zach, for calling in. You always have such great questions. Uh, thank you for allowing me to call in, Jason. Paul, thank you so much for answering my questions, man. I You're greatly welcome. appreciate it. And I right. and I definitely want to check out your new book, brother, that just came out. So I'll definitely be uh, checking up on that. Have a good night, everybody. All right, have a good Columbus Day. Try ArgusPublishing.com or Argus Books. I'll toss in another uh, celebrity name. Uh, when I was a little boy, I played uh, Little League Baseball in Cape Girardeau, and my one of my umpires was a bulky guy named Rusty. You know him better today as Rush oh, no. Limbaugh, the broadcaster. <laughs> that Somebody is called town. into his show in 2006 and said, Rush, what's up with this Cape Girardeau UFO thing from your hometown? Wow. And uh, live on the air, I've heard this from two different sources. I didn't hear it myself, but uh, they said, Rush said, uh, there's more to this story than you might think. And then he didn't want to talk about it, and he moved on to the next caller. Whoa. But, you know, Rush, he would absolutely obliterate this if it was nonsense. He would say, I don't want to talk about this right. foolishness. There's nothing to it. It's a bunch of baloney. But he didn't say that. He huh. said there's more to this story than you might think. Rush's father was a big aviation buff. He became a pilot in Cape Girardeau. He was in town during the... Uh, uh, Mo 41 affair, I found out from researching uh, the newspaper accounts of his uh, coming back from college for the Easter Passover break. So uh, if anyone in the whole town knew the secret about uh, Cape Girardeau's uh, crash, I bet it would have been Rush Limbaugh II. Rush the wow. Third is the famous broadcaster. Uh, I've also been told by another source, Rush tells a few people he knows in confidence that he heard about the Cape Girardeau UFO crash in the early 1960s when he was in high school. So uh, I have not been in contact with Rush, but there's another source who will not tell you, oh, it's a bunch of bunk. Uh, they will not want to discuss it. Uh, there's so many uh, Republicans and conservatives involved in this case, I guess, and they just don't want ridicule. They want to be taken seriously politically, so that means kind of, Keeping your oh, imagine about Limbaugh said, oh, UFOs. yeah, I know there's aliens, blah, 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 and came out with that. I mean, he'd be ripped apart. They're like, oh, yeah, Rush is losing ridiculed. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, there's no way. That's that's why, might you know, people were hoping that Trump would come out with this. I'm like, all right, everybody already thinks, you know, everybody that doesn't like Trump already thinks he's crazy and lies and all that stuff. I think he would be the worst president to do it. Because <laughs> nobody would believe him. Yeah, unless he were to release government documents that back up everything and say, right. here it is, go ahead and read it for yourself, and then it, we wouldn't have to take Trump at his word. We could read awesome. the uh, uh, the paperwork. That'd be awesome. That'd be the only way he should do it if, if he were. I don't think he would. Or, or let's say, I've got this on video. They've shown me this on a disc. I'm going to release this disc uh, to the media. Here are the uh, images of crashes in the past and uh, extraterrestrials we've made contact with. Once again, you would not have to take Trump's word. You could just look at the uh, the photos and, and film footage yourself. But who knows? Uh, if it hasn't happened by now, uh, maybe it's not going to happen. I, you know, I, I doubt he, he they would get let him get anywhere near that kind mm. of information. He'd be the last person to tell. You know, Zach was mentioning you know, John F. Kennedy being the last president. Uh, to know about it, you know, who's been the rumor that he was going to reveal it, and that's why they had to assassinate him. There's a lot more to to the JFK assassination than that, trust me. Um, but you do wonder, you know, if a president was informed of this, found out, whatever, what the, what links they would go to to stop him from saying anything. That is one of the rumors about JFK that he was going to go public uh, about what he knew, and he that to share it with the uh, first too. he wanted to share it with the Soviet Union yep. and cold warriors that were absolutely aghast at that oh, idea, yeah. and that might have been a factor in getting rid of the man. I mean, people like Howard Hunt on his deathbed came out and said, "We did it." You know, I was part of a team. You know, we were proud That's of right. it. He was proud of it. Even at, all these years later on his deathbed, proud of it. Like, I saved the United States from this guy. He was going to betray us to the Soviets, basically. You know, that, that was the mentality back then. You know, I mean. Well, I, I, 
I Good. did some research, and John F. Kennedy was a college student at Stanford University in California at the time of the April 1941 crash. But he had a meteoric rise. He was soon appointed uh, by that fall to the office of Naval Headquarters, and he rubbed shoulders with the biggest military big shots. Here he was with no uh, naval training. He did not go to Bethesda Naval School, wow. and yet he was uh, assigned to Naval Headquarters in Washington, one uh, author said that he was a liaison with FDR's White House, that he typed up uh, highly sensitive reports. And it's interesting to note that uh, President Roosevelt's uh, personal physician was an old Navy man. And if he did handle the bodies and give them an autopsy, this would have been a matter of naval intelligence. And guess who soon found his telephone tapped in late 1941? Young John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, J. Edgar Hoover was monitoring his uh, statements to uh, people, especially his girlfriend at the time, worried about what he was blabbing about, possibly classified information that he was finding out at ONI headquarters. So well, was the Marilyn Cape Monroe Toronto affair? Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> Supposedly he told Marilyn Monroe and uh, Robert Kennedy as well mm -hmm. that there were gray aliens that we recovered and uh, they were being held uh, at one point at an Air Force base. Marilyn told her friend this, who swore up and down this story is true. So uh, it, it turns a little secondhand, thirdhand stories, but... Uh, it's quite fascinating and tantalizing to this day. Well, you know, you mentioned Truman, uh, you know, being also inv heavily involved in this. You know, he wasn't supposed to be the vice president, you know. Right. But he was supposed to be Wallace. And, yeah, here's another uh, strange yeah. story. Guess where Harry Truman lived in the summer of 1906? Cape Girardeau. Of course. He knew Cape Girardeau citizens. He would visit on his campaigns. He was quite well versed in... Uh, the Cape Girardeau countryside and the farms and such, Harry was a former farmer in southern Missouri himself. So in 1941, Harry Truman uh, was in the Senate, and he began uh, investigating military matters on Capitol Hill. And I'm pretty sure he found out what was going on at the time, being a trusted Freemason and all. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1940, just to go back a year, Harry was not supported by FDR in the election campaign. No, he wanted uh, Wallace. That's yeah, what the President people Truman. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, President Roosevelt backed Harry's opponent in the Democratic primary. He mm. didn't like Harry Truman. Nope. Hated him. Suddenly, Harry has the leverage to get himself onto the ticket. Here's a man FDR hated, and suddenly he picks Harry Truman three years later to be on the uh, presidential ticket to become the next president of the United States because uh, FDR knew he was going to resign from office once World War II was finished. He didn't quite live to that uh, resignation, but he'd been telling friends he wasn't going to make it through his next term. He was, For health reasons, he was going to quit once the war was won. So he handpicked his successor. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, did the Mo 41 affair have anything to do with this decision? Harry was probably already in the know, a trusted man, a fellow Democrat, a fellow Freemason. So here was uh, President Roosevelt uh, in the year before the crash, not liking or wanting Harry Truman around in any sense. And then he turns around three years later and picks him to be the next vice president and president of the United States. Well, I would like to say, I would like to interject on that. I don't, I, I, knowing my history, Roosevelt didn't really pick him. They stole it in the primary. They stole it from, it was Wallace, right? It was Wallace was his VP at uh, the time. Wallace was the vice president in 1940, and a lot yeah. of people were dissatisfied with him, and they wanted him replaced, and yeah. FDR grudgingly allowed this, and he said, uh, I'll give you some names, and Harry Truman was on that list, and eventually he settled on Harry Truman. So um, uh, well, they, Wallace they, they, was out. Well, they stole it from him. The, the, the night of the primary, you know, the big night that everybody was chanting for Wallace, and they the could have voted yeah. at the convention. They could have voted Wallace in that yeah. night, and they shut That's it down. That's right, and they shut it down really quick and got yeah. into that, didn't they? Yeah, and, and he was the people's choice. I mean, you're talking yeah, about the delegates in... wanted uh, Wallace, but uh, for some reason, yeah. uh, well, the FDR the bosses, people the yeah, pulled a little end around that, didn't they? Yeah, well, the Democratic bosses in the party didn't want Wallace. He he was an, he made a lot of enemies because he was the people's man. He, he actually was a big part of the, the New Deal, you know. Uh, and, and bringing agriculture, getting the agriculture back. I mean, we've talked about getting recovering from the dust storms. Wallace was the people's man. You know, we, this nation could have been completely different 
if he he if was he, a trusted vice president, yeah. and for some reason he had a terrible fall from power, and uh-huh. uh, eventually he quit Harry Truman's cabinet, and oh, he yeah. sort of faded yeah. away there. Well, he disagreed with him on a number of issues, including dropping the bomb. That's correct. You know, so he was seen as a commie supporter. You know, that's how it was back then. But you know, it's it's, it's interesting. They probably didn't want you. You, you had to think about it. I mean, the Democratic bosses made a lot of enemies. They definitely wanted them out, but they wanted somebody in that probably already knew the information, like the, about the MO forty one case. Is what I've always you know wondered when you get when you talk about that. They wanted somebody that knew about it already. Wallace probably wasn't kept in the loop. You don't. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. yeah. So the, Truman already knew. So let's get somebody in that knows. That, that we can well, control. It is true that Vice President Wallace kept an office in the U.S. Capitol building where the alien materials might well have been stored, but that doesn't necessarily mean he was taken downstairs and shown all right. this material. So um, yeah, The military uh, didn't like him. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand why he fell so far so fast. Uh, maybe he was saying things he shouldn't have about... Uh, certain uh, subjects and people, but uh, uh, FDR and his uh, Democratic uh, Party bigwigs wanted him gone. Well, he wanted a deal. He wanted peace with Russia. That's the one thing they just did not want, that Wallace was for us, you know, trying to make a good terms at the end of the war with Russia, and that was not something that the military wanted, Democratic leaders didn't want. You know, they, 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 he, he fell out of power quick because they just turned, you know, when he eventually tried to run again, you know, tried to run as president, you know, he, law, he only had like 3% of the, the primary vote. Because, <laughs> when FDR suddenly died, where was Harry Truman? He was under the Capitol building doing something, going right. somewhere, and they tracked him down and said, you need to get over to the White House pretty quick. They didn't tell him that he'd just become president. But when he spoke to reporters the next day, he used this term. He said, I feel like the sun, the moon, and the stars all came crashing down on me. And I'm thinking, if you knew about the Cape Girardeau affair and uh, you were really um, uh, emotionally attached to that, uh, this is a a very telling statement when you uh, become president of the United States of all the things that you could say. He's talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars crashing crashing down down on him. Uh, One one could have been... That, you know, first they tell him, hey, we're working on this bomb. That's going to be pretty devastating. And two, all that rumors you know about about aliens, you know some of it. It is true. <laughs> yeah, I can see that happening in a briefing, yes. Yeah, and maybe he was down in the Capitol building because somebody was taking him down there. Like, we have something to show you. <laughs> you know, you, you, you wonder. It's, it's something we'll never know. It's the, it's the man behind the curtain, you know. It, we'll never know what that secret is, you know, that uh, lies under the Capitol or in Area 51. And uh, know what these presidents get to see or go through, you know, with this. In, another interesting president I know you have on your on your book cover um, is you had Truman, you had Roosevelt, but you didn't have him on your book cover was Eisenhower. Right. Uh, he came along in the 1950s. However, he was a very influential Army man in the 1940s, mm-hmm. but he wasn't that well ranked. Uh, he didn't have his big rise to power that came through a success in World War II yet. So uh, I don't know what Mr. Eisenhower found out about the Cape Girardeau affair, if anything, but uh, I have no information that he talked about it. No, but he definitely was a big part of building the military-industrial complex in this country and fomenting secrecy, for sure. And then uh, warned Americans about this on his farewell address to the nation, saying we've got a real problem, and that was uh, was very startling to people back in 1961. I mean, he named the military-industrial complex, international banking community. He, he, I think, uh, you always wonder, is did he realize by the end of his presidency, I've lost control of this? You know, is what I've always wondered. Possibly, yeah. You know? Could it be, you know, you know, he, because I've heard the rumors that he, at some point towards the end of his presidency, he was starting to be felt like he was kept out of the loop of what was going on with the whole alien um, technology and what was going on in that in that front. That it was just gone by then. You know, Majestic Twelve comes into existence. You know, right when you know a president's days in office are numbered and that he's had health problems, why would you tell him anything? He's right. on his way out. He's an old man. He's going to retire somewhere. So. And a lot of people think that's why he made that speech, you know, because he was being kept out of the loop. And it was kind of his, you know, like payback a little bit and regret that he set up that institution. 
Well, uh, it's certainly uh, tantalizing theories. I sure wish we could get more documents, you know, uh, real gold uh, released by the government. It's been 50, 60, 75 years for many of these affairs. Why can't the government come clean to its own people and release these uh, have papers? You tr- There's no one left alive to compromise today. Have you done any FOA searches or uh, submitted Freedom any? of information. I tried on one aspect, and I didn't get very far. Okay, nobody usually uh, does. Yeah. Uh, they can give you all kinds of stories why you can and can't have this. And uh, it, it reminds me of, um, well, I won't go into that story about uh, an airplane crash from 1942 that I include in my second book, and those documents included uh, information about a UFO hanging over a mountainside where this airplane crashed. The documents were only released 40 years later after a Freedom of Information Act, and they were heavily redacted. This is how ridiculous our government uh, treats uh, matters that are decades, decades old, and uh, people are long since moved on with their lives, but they still don't want to tell you anything or reveal anything. Roswell's the most blatant because they've come out with three different versions of what happened. You know, yeah. trying to write it off the, the the final Roswell report. You know, basically, this is what happened. Wait, no, wait, that's not the final one. <laughs> we got another one, another excuse, and each one is just as stupid. Uh, they just don't add up. They don't yeah. make sense. But it kind of is scary that your government will lie right to your face like this and tell you, uh, well, this is what happened. Take our word for it and keep your mouth shut. Well, and of you course, know, any investigation that shows that this is not what happened, they're lying to us. And they don't care whether you don't like it or not. Uh, so uh, we just have to take it and lump it, I guess. Well, you know, you, the, it, it, we roll right back to before you came on the show tonight, my beginning news segment. Of course, I had to cover the Las Vegas shooting. And I got hounded from some people for questioning some of the events of that. And uh, I go, my, my main question is, everybody, okay, I, I, my one question is, why do you trust the FBI? Why do you trust your government? They've done nothing but prove they lie to us. Done nothing but in, lie to us. In many cases, that is correct, and are we supposed to take their word now? Yeah, they've lost uh, at the At least the media is covering this story, at least trying to, and the uh, FBI is involved, Sheriff's Department, Police Department, the hotel security. There are a number of sources who could crack and reveal things in the coming days and weeks. Oh, yeah. But that's my thing. Is like Everybody's like, well, why are these people jumping, all these conspiracy nutters and all that stuff? I'm like, don't you guys get it? They've lost their credibility. They lost it a long time ago, and it's just getting worse. Every time something crazy happens like this, you know, people question it. They're looking for conspiracy. They're looking for it. More and more people are. It, the, 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 the conspiracy isn't just a little group of conspiracy nuts anymore. It's a lot of people. And, yeah, it's the Internet. Yeah, it's social media. But the reason it's happening is people are, are waking up that they've been lied to countlessly because of stupid lies like the ones for Roswell that's, that are completely ludicrous. Well, my novel has nothing to do with guns or violence or shooting, but I took many years to write it, set it in Las Vegas, and talk about the Mesquite UFO crash of 1962. So what happens? The shooting comes along this very week. The man was from Mesquite, shot at people in Las Vegas, and he wasn't far from, uh, like, almost across the street, practically, from the secretive airport where they take flights out to Area 51. Mm -hmm. Janus Airlines. And it's just very strange. Uh, I think... People could use a laugh now more than ever, and I'm hoping they will uh, find my book uh, and all the humor I try to pack in there to know, reach a, read a wider it. audience. I, know, uh, I, I hope they it. will enjoy that. <laughs> I want to read it for sure. I love the title of Alone. If I just was going through a bookstore and I saw Sexy <laughs> Alien Races in Las like, Vegas, what's this about? <laughs> I, I would be totally there. I'd be totally there. I'd be like, that's my book. I'm going to, that's my next book I'm reading. <laughs> well, uh, the first reviewer has given it a really good review and says it's a must read. And every author wants to hear that. Oh, of course. And I was uh, mighty pleased to hear that. So I'm trying to send out copies to uh, newspapers and uh, uh, book reviewers and radio stations. And I'll be in the media more often in the coming uh, weeks to discuss uh, these. Uh, uh, Nevada-based UFOs, but I'm always up for talking about Mo 41 from my old hometown of Cape Girardeau and learning any more information. If anyone out there has any more data, send it to me on my Facebook page or my uh, special uh, Cape Girardeau's 1941 UFO Crash America's First Facebook page. 
you can send me an email. I've got uh, www.mo41.info is my website. And if you want to learn more, you can buy the books from Argus Publishing to this day. I sure uh, thank you for your support. And uh, the more we can get this across, maybe we can get a, a documentary or even a, a theatrical film out of this and really uh, expose the Cape Girardeau affair on a national or international level and get it the attention it deserves. And who knows, somewhere out there, that photo. Of the alien, them holding up the alien. Really, could be I'd out there. love to see that leaked. Right. You, know, <laughs> you never know. You never know in this world. That photo could be hidden away somewhere. Somebody might have it hidden away. They hear a show like this and go, that's what that photo is? <laughs> it's been yeah, in the family or the for years. Negatives, uh, or the negatives. Yeah. Na- yeah. If someone uh, stumbles upon it or they know it's in a safety deposit box, they can always mail it to me. <laughs> always or mail me. it to my uh, publisher and, and care of me and they'll get it to me. Hey, you, you, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Rock. But at the end of that movie, when he goes into the church and finds the little film canister, has like all these secrets, including aliens and stuff on it. At the end uh-huh. of that movie, you always wonder: Is there somebody out there's got just been keeping a cache of this this information, and it's just hidden somewhere, where away somewhere in some church or some you know hidden spot, and somebody's going to just find it. You know, you wonder. Eventually, is it gonna, the truth going to get out there? Uh, it, one day it will. You know, one day I, I honestly believe they just cannot keep throw, shoveling the crap they're shoveling at us. It's going to fall apart. I think it is. I think a lot of their, the secrets are falling apart. They just they can't control it anymore. I sure hope so. I hope somebody blabs. I hope somebody sends a film or a, a secret documents to researchers, but there will always be a disbelieving crowd saying, you made this up. You mm-hmm. printed them on your own. This is a fake. Don't believe them. Blah blah blah. Oh, they got and media to like we said up. earlier, there have been a lot of fakes in ufology. Oh, of course, there's a ton. I mean, I and mean, we're dealing with people like Hami Musan, who's uh, yes. you know, putting up is, hoax uh, after hoax, and people mummy. still keep looking at it. I'm like, why? Why? I mean, I mean he, how many hoaxes does this guy have to bring to our attention for us to not know they're a hoax? I mean, everything he does is involved in a hoax. You know, it's like, it, it, you know. We have to fight past the BS. That's the sad part. But there is truth out there. There is reality. And in this case, the, you know, this is before any of that. And like I said, why would an, like you're interviewing an 80 year old woman? Why would she lie at the end of yeah. her life? What purpose? What good would? Why would she even do it? Integrity is important to me. I want to assure all of your listeners. I only put in facts and actual, uh, reasonable speculation. I put in lots of um, footnotes and resources where I got this. I don't just make up a lot of stuff out of thin air. This is not sensationalistic, tabloid type of books. No. You'll find a mountain of data. I want to give people their money's worth when they get a, a book like this. And so uh, I've taken a different term by trying a, a fiction book and putting in lots of laughs. But you'll still learn about uh, things like uh, Robert O'Dean and his secret classified files that he saw and uh, the Bob Lazar case and the... Uh, uh, the airplane crash outside of Las Vegas in 42 and the UFO involved within sexy alien races. And I'm trying to take a different approach to reach uh, a wider audience, and we'll see how it goes. Well, I, 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 I'm definitely going to get this book. You said Argus Publishing. Right. All right. Well, I'm going to look that up. I want to get that book. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming on. And uh, if you ever want to come on again to discuss more of this, the show goes by so quick. I, we could talk more and more on this. I would love to. So I definitely love having you on the show again. Thank you so much for being on. You're welcome. See you next time. See you next time, Paul. Thank you. All right, guys. Next Sunday, we will be back. And more aliens. Yes, more alien talk. We're going to have Chad and Alta Dillard. We were on a month ago, and we talked about their book, Orbducted, and their experience. We touched, just barely touched the tip of the iceberg with that. We're going to have them on again. We're going to talk more about it, give them more time, because I, I swear they have so much of it. I read their book. They have so much more to their story. I felt bad to give them such a little time. I don't think I'm going to even do a second commercial break that night, just so we can give them all the time we can to really get it out there, because there's so much to their story, and it's so crazy, but it's it, you can feel the honesty in it. So, all right, guys, next Sunday, Chad and Alta Dillard, we're going to be on, talk more, part two of Orbducted. So this this uh, alien month continues. <laughs> of course, and during the month of October, you think, 
should be in ghosts, but we're doing aliens this month. We'll get to the ghosts and stuff at the Halloween show, which we might be on. We're doing a marathon on Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network on the 27th. Still waiting for the details, so we might be on that Friday night uh, to do our Halloween show maybe with that marathon. I don't know. Waiting on the times, but there will be a Halloween show either Friday the 27th or that Sunday after. We're going to have a Halloween show. You guarantee it. We always do every year. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Check us out on Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup Facebook page on YouTube at Paranormal Soup. Always can listen to us on Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network.com. Go to there. We're on TuneIn and also on the Streaming Paranormal app. You can check us out on all those places. See you guys next Sunday. Same bat time, same bat channel, 10 p.m. to midnight central time. Have a great Columbus Day. Uh, see you next Sunday. Oh, yeah.